right, it's a pleasure to see you all here tonight. Would you um, take God's Word tonight and open, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, we're dealing with the issue of prayer, and there's no better place to talk about prayer than in Matthew 6, where the Lord is teaching the Lord's Prayer to His disciples. He, he does this in response to the request that the disciples gave to Him, Lord, teach us to pray. They heard Jesus pray, and they knew that there was something different about the way he prayed, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray like you do. And so this section that we're going to look at tonight, actually we're going to really just look at one verse, verse number 9, is really about how to approach God in prayer. I remember years ago I was in Cameroon, Africa, teaching at the Cameroon Baptist Theological Seminary, and the president of the seminary came one day and, uh, to me while I was teaching a class there, and he said, the governor of the province um, is coming here to the seminary. He uh, heard that you're here, and he wants to meet you. And uh, so what he did was he began to coach me on the protocol on how to speak and how to act in front of the governor so as not to offend him. You didn't want to offend the governor of the province there. And so, um, you know, he went through a, a list of protocols for me, things for me to do, and things not for me to do. If you live in a country with a sovereign monarchy, you don't just pop in on the king and say, hey, how are you doing? There's a protocol on how you approach a monarch. If you have an interview with a king, you need to have some coaching on what to say and what not to say, uh, obviously because of the importance of the person that you are addressing. This is especially true when you come before the king of kings. We all need some coaching on how to do that. And some may think that because God is sovereign and holy that we should perhaps not bother him with our petty needs. And maybe there are some that come completely apologetic and timidly afraid to let him know what is really on our heart. And so we all need to know how we approach God. What is the right attitude that we have when we come to God in prayer? And this is what the Lord is going to teach us here. And there are three basic lessons I want you to see here in this part of the Lord's Prayer. First of all, there's what I want to call the pattern for prayer. Look at verse number 9 where he says, After this manner, therefore pray ye. Notice Jesus did not say, pray this prayer. He said, pray like this, after this manner. In other words, follow this pattern. Follow this model. The Lord's Prayer is repeated today by some people as if it's some kind of magic formula that's going to work if you just repeat the words word for word. The disciples didn't say, Lord, teach us a prayer. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus just taught his disciples that prayer is not just some mindless, mechanical repeating of words. Remember, he said, don't use, you know, don't pray like the heathen. Don't pray like the, um, the, he, uh, the uh, hypocrites. Uh, who just mind or, or give mindless words or, and don't pray haphazardly. And the Lord just told them, you know, don't give mindless words over and over again. That's not prayer. It's ironic that people use the Lord's Prayer in that way right after Jesus said, don't do that. We know that this is not a formula or a word-for-word -word prayer. How do we know that? Because this same prayer is mentioned in Luke 11, and the wording is different. If this was a, a prayer to memorize and recite, he wouldn't have used different words. Now, there's nothing wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer. That's okay if you want to do that. But what you're doing is you're quoting Scripture, and again, that's all right. And if you want to recite the Lord's Prayer as a way to give you inspiration on how to pray to follow that pattern, that's all good. But just know that there's nothing magical about the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern that we are to follow. Another thing I, I see is that, you know, in the New Testament, I never see this, word, this prayer repeated word for word. If this was a, a, a prayer that Jesus said, look, here's a, a prayer I want you to pray, how come it's never used ever else in the New Testament? No, this is like a skeleton where we fill in the meat. This is a pattern where we are to use as we go to the Lord in prayer. The great New Testament scholar, Jeremiah, uh, wrote a, a great book on prayer, and he said this is a primer upon which our prayers should be patterned. Uh, the Puritan Thomas Brooks wrote this. He said, the Lord's Prayer is given as a directory for prayer, a pattern and an example by which we are to regulate our petitions and make other prayers. It has the ideal order of prayer, if you notice this Lord's Prayer. First, there's God, and then secondly, there's man. First, there's spiritual needs, and then secondly, there's physical needs. 
First, there's the kingdom and his will, and then our concerns after that. And really, the Lord's Prayer, if you look at it closely, is just six petitions. Again, the first three have to do with God's glory. The last three have to do with our well-being. It's his name. It's his kingdom. It's his will. And then after that, it is our debts. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Thy, 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 and then us, us, us. And so that's the pattern there of the Lord's Prayer. First, there's relationship, our Father. Then there's responsibility, how it be thy name. And then after that, there are the requests, give us this day our daily bread. And so Jesus says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And the word prayer there is an imperative. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Jesus is commanding us to pray. For the believer, prayer is not an option. If we don't pray, we're living lives of disobedience. And the verb is also present tense, meaning it should be a continual practice. Prayer for a believer is just a way of life. It's just like breathing. If you have time to breathe, you have time to pray. So we could really paraphrase it like this. After this pattern, I'm giving you continue to pray. That's really how we could read that. That's the pattern of prayer. But secondly, I want you to see the perspective of prayer. Again, in verse number 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. This gives us the perspective on how we are to approach God. And what we're going to see is it gives us a balanced perspective. First of all, think about the sympathy of a father. He says, our Father. And that tells me that prayer is an intimate relationship with God. First, he is our Father, so we approach him on the basis of a parent-child relationship. Now, this was a revolution in relationship as far as Jesus' day was concerned. In order really to understand the full impact of this, we have to understand that no Old Testament Jew ever addressed God as my father or our father. Again, the German theologian Jeremiah, a New Testament scholar, did a study on which he searched through the Old Testament writings and and extent writings from the ancient uh, Jewish sources And he could not find a single example ever of a Jewish writer or author addressing God directly as Father. He couldn't find that in Jewish writings until the 10th century A.D. That was just something that was unheard of. He found examples of God being referred to as the Father, but the words Father was never used in a direct form of personal address. It was never in a personal way. And so this was was interesting to him. And then um, Jeremiah went on to um, study, and he also examined the prayers of Jesus, and there he made an equally fascinating discovery. In every prayer of Jesus recorded in the New Testament except one, he addresses God as Father. Every one. The only prayer where Jesus did not address God as Father is when on the cross he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that was the point where Jesus was taking the sins of the world upon himself And God the Father turned away from his son at that moment. So Jesus, all throughout his earthly ministry, addressed him as my father. This, by the way, enraged the Pharisees and the Jews. They thought that he was taking liberties that he should not. But basically, Jesus was teaching a new pattern of prayer. And this was the thing that really was what caused the disciples to say, Lord, we want to be able to pray like you. They, they sensed an intimacy in the prayers of the Lord Jesus. And when he said, Father, uh, again, Jeremiah in his study said he's really using the Aramaic term Abba, which is the most intimate term for father. A little child in that day would call their father Abba. It meant daddy. And again, this was the word that Jesus used. This is the most intimate word that you could use to talk about the father and child relationship. And again, this was what was unique. This was revolutionary. No one ever prayed this way. They didn't refer to God as their father or our father, let alone as Abba, that that intimate term there. That was an incredible thing for people to hear back in Jesus' day. And again, this was the reason why the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray the way you pray. The way Jesus prayed was so intimate. You know, I, I mentioned the last time we talked about prayer that there's these teachings out there that say, you know, if you want to get intimate with God, you have to have some kind of a prayer language. 
some kind of language that nobody understands. It's a divine language. You know, it's not any earthly or known language. That's the, 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 the one view on tongues that are out there. But again, I tell you, there's no more intimate prayer than the prayer that you read here with Jesus and his Father. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and he used that term, Abba, Father. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He used again that term, Abba, there. And so this is an intimate way to approach God. And we approach God on the basis of children going to their parents. You ever notice how free children are to talk to their parents about things, especially when they want something? They're very free in the way they talk about it. They approach on a very intimate basis. And there's a sympathy here because a parent has compassion on their children and, and wants to give the child whatever they need. In fact, parents, um, Jesus said at one point, if, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more does your Father in heaven know how to give good gifts to those who come and ask him? And so this is a, this is a foundational perspective for a prayer. This is the intimacy that we need to have as we approach God in prayer. And also, I would say another thing about this, this is an indication of your spiritual health and your spiritual life. It's a, ch- it's a sign of you being a true child of God. Because if you are a believer and the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you, you're going to find yourself crying out with, from the Holy Spirit's inspiration inside, from the Holy Spirit's prompting inside, you're going to be crying out, Abba, Father. You ever do that? Just cry out to God with, from, the, from your heart. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And Romans 8, 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so this is a sign of your, your true nature as a child of God. You, you, that, that should come naturally to someone who is truly a believer. You want to cry out to God as your father. So we see the sympathy of a father, but also, secondly, we see the sovereignty of a king. Because again, look at verse number nine. Our Father, which art in what? Heaven. And that statement here recognizes the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the majesty of God. It puts him on his throne. It recognizes the greatness of who God is. And this statement here, I think, adds balance to the first statement. You know, if we're, if we're not careful, we can come a little bit too flippantly to God in prayer. We can be a little too casual. So there are two extremes to, to avoid. We don't want to treat God as if he's so transcendent that he's so out of touch that we could never really approach him. No, God is like a parent. He's like a, a father who wants to, to meet the needs of his children. And there's an intimacy there that we have as children of God. But the other extreme is that of extreme imminence. And I think this is really perhaps more of the error that I see a lot of times in prayer today, where that we, have, we, we become so sentimental and we become so careless uh, and so, quote, unquote, down to earth that we begin to use language that is not fitting to a sovereign king. And we need to be careful about that. We don't treat God as if he's some kind of celestial teddy bear. And we don't come with too much casualness. We come recognizing how great that he is. And so this gives us confidence when we pray. All true prayer starts by recognizing the power of and the majesty of Almighty God. Listen to how David prayed. He said this, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. And thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. I think that's great. That's the majesty that, that we're talking about here. And so, and so this is the balance that we need to keep. God is our Father. Jesus prayed, Abba, Father. But we also recognize he's the sovereign king, and there's nothing too hard for him to do. I like another parallel prayer that Jesus said in Mark 1436, Abba, Father, and then the next phrase is, nothing is impossible unto thee. There you have it. 
intimacy of a father and the sovereignty of a king, right there in that next expression that Jesus gave. And so we come realizing that um, God can do anything. It gives us confidence. God can turn the heart of that troubled teen. God can save the most hard-hearted sinner. God can deliver from the worst illness and disease. God can supply all of your needs. All you have to do is come and you ask him of that, that, what that need is. And so we recognize his sovereignty overall. There's a movement in the church today called the name it and claim it movement where you just name whatever you want. And if you can, if you can just name it and conceive it in your mind and you confess it before God, that somehow you bind God. And if you name it and claim it, he has to give it. You know what that does? That makes the sinner, or I should say the, the, the prayer or the person who's praying, that makes him sovereign rather than God. That's, uh, that's faith in faith, is if faith is some kind of a thing that you speak into existence, you know, and, and then you bind God. That's nothing of the sort. God is sovereign, not you. And prayer is accomplishing God's sovereign will on earth the way God wants it to be done. And so that's a perversion of prayer. They treat God like a heavenly genie in a bottle, and if they can just get him out of that bottle and make a wish, then God has to give them whatever they want. That's manipulation. That is not prayer, and that is beneath God. That is, that is abominable prayer, if you ask me. So we recognize the sympathy of a father. We recognize the sovereignty of a king. That's the perspective of prayer. But let me give you the third thing. We see the pattern. Jesus says, pray like this. Use this example. We see the perspective that we have. But then number three, there's what I call the priority of prayer. And notice the rest of verse number nine. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is where we enter into the the worship of prayer. And the reason I call it a priority is because um, prayer at its highest is an act of worship. That's the priority of prayer. We come to God because we worship him. We hallow his name. The word hallow here from the Greek Hegaizo, which is from a word that means to set apart as holy or to treat as holy. And again, this is an imperative. This is a command. We can say it like this. Um, God, you know, you treat God holy or you count God holy or we hallow God's name. There's a force behind this, you know. Um, and so that's part of what prayer is. But, and there's a sense also in which even though it's an imperative, it's also yet a petition because part of what we're praying is that God's name be counted as holy, that God be treated the way he should be treated as holy God. That should be the first concern of us as believers when we go to prayer. We want God's name to be hallowed. God's name is sacred. God's name is to be treated as sacred. And so, um, we honor his name. If you had the opportunity to write a new constitution for the United States of America, a constitution that included a Bill of Rights containing 10 declarations, and those 10 declarations would be the foundational precepts for a new nation, what would your 10 declarations be? Did you ever think about that? Would you include a declaration that safeguarded the sanctity of human life? Would you include a declaration that protected private property? Would you include a declaration that parents be honored? No doubt some of you are thinking right now what you would probably include in your list of 10. That, they would be the things that would be the most important to you. So what would your first declaration be? The first thing on your list would probably be the thing that is the most important thing to you. Would you have as one of your declarations a mandate protecting how we use God's name? Would that be on the top of your list? Few people hallow God's name or treat God's name uh, holy as a top priority in their life. But for the believer, that ought to be. But we don't think like that in America anymore. In fact, God's name is, is trampled upon. God's name is not hallowed. By the way, God did give such a document as he constituted a nation, and it's found in Exodus chapter 20, and he did give 10 precepts. You know what they are. And on the top part of that list is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He said this at the very beginning of the formation of the nation of Israel. 
So we need to treat God's name as holy, and this is part of what we do in the way in which we pray. And there are three ways that we do that. First of all, it's with attitudes, with attitudes. It is we reverence him with our attitude. Do you count God's name as holy in your attitude? You know, the Jews, they reverence the name of God. In fact, they never even spoke that name out loud. There was what is called the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name in Hebrew, and they never even spoke it because it was too sacred for them to even speak. They would always replace it with Hashem, the name, or they would replace it with Adonai, which is a a reduced name of God, um, which basically meant Lord. But they would not speak God's name because they had too much reverence for that name. That's the attitude that we need to have. God's name is so holy to us. It is so reverent to us. We do it in our attitude, also with our words. How we speak the name of God is an expression of how we reverence it. To speak God's name in an abusive, irreverent manner is blasphemous. I don't think of any, I can't think of anything that reveals the state of a person's soul more clearly than the words that come out of their mouth. And that's especially in reference to how they talk about God. How can you worship someone that during the week you routinely blaspheme? How do you do that? That should not be among a Christian. Now, before we were saved, before we knew the Lord, we thought nothing of using God's name in an irreverent way, but that should not be in the thought of a child of God after they know Jesus Christ. We need to be careful that, and we don't, that we don't give any affirmation to God's name being used in an irreverent manner. And so we need to be careful. Now, it seems like you can say that you can um, use God's name in any way now that blasphemes his name, and, and it doesn't bother anybody anymore. I think television and society has, has caused us to be so uh, accustomed. We're dull now because we hear it so much. But I don't know about you, but I still get angry when I hear the name of God blasphemed. I can't stand to hear that name blasphemed. Several years ago, there was a magazine article about a truck driver who had been arrested in Maryland for drunken disorderly conduct. And he was verbally abusive to the arresting officer, so much so that by the time they got him to the judge, they wanted the judge to throw the book at him. But really, um, what he committed was a misdemeanor. And the judge saw that according to the statutes of the state of Maryland, the maximum penalty that he could impose on the truck driver for drunk and disorderly conduct was a fine of $100 and 30 days in jail. However, the judge also noticed on the law books a prohibition against public blasphemy that had been there for a long, long time. So he assigned another 30 days in jail and another $100 fine because in his verbal abuse of the officers during the time of his arrest, the truck driver blasphemed the name of God. And so because of that, the judge was able to up the fine and keep him in jail 30 days longer. Well, there was a magazine that published a story, and they wrote an editorial protesting the outdated what they called puritanical law that was still on the books and being enforced in our modern and sophisticated culture. The editors were furious that anyone in America in this day and age would be penalized by the law for publicly blaspheming God. Shows you how things have changed. By the way, I think that's a good law. I would say it's okay to throw someone in jail for 30 days if they blaspheme the name of God. And, and then give, uh, not 100, let's up it, inflation and everything. Let's up it to 500. That truck driver should be glad that he didn't live in ancient Israel. Because if he blasphemed God in that culture, it would have cost him more than 30 days in jail and $100. It would have cost him his life. Because in ancient Israel, anyone who blasphemed the name of God was punished with capital punishment if they kept the letter of the law. And that's how God thought about it. But, to, but today we live in this topsy-turvy world where the values are radically different. And our country today tosses aside the values of the biblical worldview. But Jesus still tells us as his children, hallow his name. You treat God's name as holy. How a society treats the name of God is a reflection of the spiritual climate of that culture. 
which means we're in trouble and we need to repent. But then also, we reverence God's name not only by our attitudes and our words, but also in our deeds. It's, it's taken, really, um, in the way that we live our life, we take God's name in vain if we don't live up to the name by which we have been called. We are God's children. So when you become a child of God, you take the name of God upon yourself. You are, after all, a Christian, right? Which means like Christ. So you take God's name upon yourself. And the way you act should reflect that you hollow God's name. So if you call yourself a Christian and you're not living and acting like a Christian before the world, you're taking God's name in vain. And you're giving God a bad name. You're causing the world to blaspheme God. Because if they look at your life and they see someone that's not real or someone who doesn't, who acts just like they do, that there's nothing different about you from the world and you call yourself a Christian, then you're not hallowing the name of God. In Exodus 20, when God made a covenant with Israel, Israel took the name of God upon itself. They became God's people. They became God's peculiar people, a nation of priests. And their mission was to show to the world the nature and the character of God by how they lived their life. Now that has been passed to us. Now we as Christians, we take the name of God in the way that we live our life. And so the question is, are you hallowing God's name in the way that you live? Do you worship God's name in the day-to-day activities, the deeds that you do? Does it reflect that you worship a great God, that you treat his name as holy? Martin Luther wrote this uh, in his greater catechism. He asked, how is it God's name is hallowed amongst us? The answer when our life and our doctrine are truly Christian. And I think that's so true. I think there is out there today this general idea about worship being you come to church and you sing some worship songs over and over again, and and that's worship, that's it. Now, that's part of worship, but that's that's just one small part of it. Worship is how we live throughout the week. Not just what we do on Sunday, but what we do during the days of the week, how we live our life. We worship God in every decision that we make. We worship God with the words that we speak to others. We worship God with the deeds that we do. If you call yourself a Christian and you're living like a lost person, you are taking the Lord's name in vain. And so we hallow the name of God in the way that we live our life. And by the way, Don't expect to get your prayers answered if you live a life that doesn't hollow God's name. How can you go to God in prayer and ask anything? How can you say, hallowed be your name in prayer if you're not living that way as a Christian? That's why part of what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're we're living the right kind of life. And so this should be on the top of our prayer list. This should be how we enter into God's presence. We understand the right perspective. We have the sympathy of a father, but we also have the sovereignty of a king. And we hollow his name in the way that we live our life, with our attitudes, with our words. And so that's how we approach God in prayer. Let's bow for prayer tonight. And I want you just to, Just take a few minutes here today, tonight. I know we had a time of prayer already, but I I want you to, again, take a few minutes and seek God's face. And follow the pattern of Jesus here. Maybe, again, there's a burden or a request you want to bring to the Lord, but I want you to go to God in prayer, and I want you to thank him for being a loving, gracious father and allowing us to approach him on that basis as our Father. And I also want you to praise Him that He is a sovereign King and there's nothing too hard for Him. It may be that you have a a difficulty in in your life, an obstacle that can't be moved. That's not hard for God. He can move it. 
whatever it is. And then hallow his name. Thank God for his holy name. And if you found yourself in your past week not hallowing his name in the way that you've lived, ask God to forgive you for that. Ask God to give you a spirit of reverence. Ask God to help you wear his name in a way that honors him. And so, Father, we do hallow your great name. And with all our heart, Lord, we praise you for who you are. You're such a faithful God, a great God. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for looking upon us and our weaknesses and our faults and our failures, forgiving us, for pitting us, Lord, like a father pities his children and giving us good gifts and not withholding anything that is good to those who walk uprightly. Lord, I pray that you'll stir us up in this matter of prayer. Help us to be a praying church. Help us to be a praying people. Help us, Lord, to depend upon you daily in our life. Lord, help us to to pray as regularly as we breathe all throughout the day, seeking your face, expressing our utter dependence on you in all things. And Lord, may we see mighty things done as a result. Mighty things, Lord, so that you can receive honor and glory. And Father, we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name.